Hello and welcome to Home Worship. I'm recording this week in isolation here from my own home. And this week our story is from John chapter 2 and it's the story of the wedding at Cana. It's a really intriguing and interesting story. Uh, but let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, our Savior, our Messiah, you have come to lead us into a new kingdom. You've come to lead us into a new life. And we will follow you because you have set us free from sin. Heal our hearts, Jesus, and teach us your ways. Amen. Our Bible reading this week comes from John chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine had gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 80 to 120 litres. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then Jesus told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. So they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then they called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. John is the only gospel writer that tells of the wedding at Cana and Jesus' miracle turning water into wine. It's an intriguing and fascinating story and it serves a purpose. There are no stories included here that don't serve a purpose. John only tells us about seven of Jesus' miraculous signs. So why did he choose this one? In John's gospel, Jesus' miracles are called signs because they point us to Jesus and they reveal something about him. Something that we didn't know about him or his kingdom. So the important question we need to ask as we read this story about Jesus changing water into wine at the wedding at Cana is what does this reveal to us about Jesus? And the clues are in the details. So let's have a closer look at some of those details now. In verse 3, Jesus' mother says to him some simple words, they have no more wine. Jesus' response is, well, why are you telling me about this? That's my paraphrase. And we might wonder, indeed, why would Mary's, Jesus' mother, involve him in this problem? But this also sets the scene for us. In Jesus' day, a wedding was a really great big feast. It was a big, important occasion, even bigger than the grandest weddings that we have today. Sure, some of our weddings today are incredibly extravagant, but... The hospitality of the people in the Middle East in Jesus' day was far greater than the hospitality of today. Traditionally, the bride would prepare at her home with her bridesmaids, and there they would wait patiently for the groom to arrive. Meanwhile, the groom would be at his house making elaborate preparations. There was lots of food and wine to prepare because often half of the village was invited to the banquets. And the celebration would last for days, not just one day, but days, as in probably a whole week. And then when things were ready, the groom would walk through the streets of the village and go to collect the bride. And then they would make this procession with all of their friends making lots of noise and being joyful as they made their way through the streets of the village, declaring to everybody that their wedding was taking place. To run out of wine during the celebrations was not only sad, but it brought shame on the host family. It signaled that they didn't have the means to provide and or that they did not respect the culture 
and requirements of hospitality. So this is a very serious situation. As we're reading this story, we're meant to start to feel nervous and worried as we find out that this family is not able to provide. Okay, this is where John is very clever because this situation reveals something to us about the state of our world. And remember, in John's gospel, the world is not our natural earth. It's not the planet that we live on. The world is the fallen state of humankind as we've rebelled against God and we have shrouded ourselves in darkness. Here, John is giving us a hint or painting a picture of our dark world, which is inadequate. We are that family that is in need. We are not able to provide. We don't live up to the laws of hospitality and love. And so the scene is set for our Savior to arrive. In verse 5, Mary tells us or tells the servants to do whatever Jesus asks you to do, despite him telling her that he doesn't want to get involved. And these words really stand out to me. Do whatever he tells you to do. What has given Mary such confidence to do this? Why does she involve Jesus in this situation? Well, Mary has faith in Jesus, no doubt from her experience of living with him. She trusts him and she believes that he can help. And it's this faith that prompts her to do what Jesus tells her to do, to tell them, do what Jesus tells you to do. Not a law, not an obligation, but faith and trust in Jesus. This reflects life in the kingdom of Jesus. We don't do what Jesus says because of the law and the requirements. We do what Jesus says because we trust him and we love him and we believe in him. Jesus doesn't come with a whole pile of obligation or requirements. We know that it's good to do what Jesus says because it's good for us. And we know Jesus can help us. This is good news because we don't need more laws. There's not more instructions that can help make our lives right. We need more help than that. And here in this world, we need a savior. Jesus, we believe, is the one who can help us. Next, we see what happens when the servants do what Jesus asks them to do. And notice how quickly the story moves here. This is a very brief story. So every single detail is important. John tells us in verse 6 that nearby stood six stone water jars. These are the kinds that are used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. These six stone jars hold 75 to 120 liters each. That is a lot of water. And Jesus tells the servants to fill them up to the brim. That is a lot of quality wine. Jesus doesn't hold back. He doesn't provide a conservative amount or a safe amount of wine. He provides an abundance, more than they will need. But there's more to these stone water jars because John knows that his readers are sometimes from a Greek background. And so he goes to a lot of effort to explain the Jewish culture and the Jewish context of this story. These stone jars are for ceremonial washing. And this is an important detail because Jesus will go on to confront all kinds of Jewish cultural expectations and institutions. He will speak up at the festivals. He will challenge the rules of the Sabbath. He will overturn the tables in the temple and drive out the money changers. Here, Jesus is taking a Jewish law of ritual washing and he turns it into a celebration. He uses these stone jars as a vehicle to bring wine for the celebration. So Jesus comes and he turns requirements into celebration. He's come to people who have to work very hard to remain pure and ceremonially clean. They have many laws about this, but Jesus replaces those laws with himself, with celebration. He brings abundance to the need of God's people. He brings forgiveness for our impurity. He brings freedom into a strict culture of restriction. Jesus is a Messiah who brings freedom and abundance. In verse 10, this point is underscored. 
by a statement that is made from the banquet host. The servants bring water, which has been turned into wine, to the host for him to taste. But the host doesn't know where this water has come from. And so he's surprised. He says, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. These are incredible words and important words. You have saved the best till now. This is a description of Jesus' kingdom. Before the Messiah has arrived, we've had leaders like Moses and Joseph and David. And these are good leaders, great leaders even. But now we have the best. We've saved the best till last. Before Jesus, God's people had lots of rules to follow. But now we have grace and forgiveness. Before Jesus, the kingdom was limited to a lifetime, 70 years if we're lucky. But Jesus' kingdom is a feast without end. It points us, this wedding banquet points us to the wedding feast at the end of time, the heavenly wedding feast that has no end. Jesus has come to bring a new kingdom, a new kind of kingdom. He is our purification. He is our leader. He is our provider. Where before there was insufficiency, now we have perfect sufficiency. Before there was lack, now we have abundance. Before there was an incomplete picture, but now we have a perfect, complete picture. Before we had 70 years of life, if we're lucky, now we have everlasting life. Perfect, celebrating, rejoicing life. Before we were waiting, like the bride, waiting for her groom to arrive, now he has arrived. Jesus is our Messiah and he is here. This story reveals a lot to us about Jesus. This miracle is a sign that not only shows us Jesus' glory, but reveals the kind of king that Jesus is, the kind of kingdom that he's come to bring. This is the first of the signs through which Jesus reveals his glory, John says in verse 11. Jesus brings joy and abundance. Jesus hasn't come to take, but to give. Jesus has come not to make demands, but to meet our needs. Our Messiah is here to heal and to bring us an abundance. When we run out, He has plenty. Brothers and sisters, this is really good news. This is great news because we are desperately in need. When we exhaust our options and all of our efforts, like the Jewish people trying to meet all of their purification needs, when we exhaust our options, Jesus comes in and says, step aside, I am here and I'm going to make everything okay. We can't make ourselves pure. We can't make ourselves into the people we want to be. There's no amount of self-help that can help us. We need outside help. We need divine help. And that's what Jesus has come to bring. He is the one who brings us peace and freedom. So today, that's what I give you. I present to you Jesus, who is your sufficiency in your insufficiency. I give you Jesus, who is your purity in place of your impurity. This is the whole point of his coming. And he is here. Receive him. Receive his forgiveness in the place of your need. Receive his love when you have run out. Receive joy and celebration because we are free. We have an abundance in the grace and the hospitality of God. Where our world falls short of hospitality, God never falls short. His hospitality is eternal. It never ends. His provision is perfect and more than abundant. We belong in Jesus' kingdom. We are part of his world. We are welcome at his great heavenly banquet. What a beautiful story and what a fantastic message for us.
So now, at this point in the service, I just want to encourage you to continue giving your offerings to God. Our bank account details are up on the screen. You can give electronically or you can bring them here to the office and we can bank those for you. It's good for us to give as a reminder to ourselves that God will continue to provide for us. Now let's spend some time in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for restoring us and redeeming us. We thank you for welcoming us into your kingdom. Because of Jesus, your home is our home. And so we turn to you in all of our needs. Father, we bring you our tiredness and weariness. Bring peace to our distracted minds. And bring us to stillness in your presence. Grant us rest in the midst of our work. Lead us to the quiet waters where our souls can be restored. Father, we bring you our worries. Restore our hearts within us. Take our worries and give us courage. Take our fear and strengthen our faith. You are bigger than our fears and your kindness is all that we need. Father, we bring you our hopes. We have hopes and dreams for this year and goals that we want to achieve, but without you, our achievements are hollow. So guide us and help us in the work that we have to do and show us the plans that you have for us. Father, we bring you our joy. We thank you for all the good things that have happened this week. We praise you for every blessing. God, fill our hearts with happiness as we celebrate and enjoy the good things in life. Loving Father God, we are in your hands. Nothing and no one can take you away from us. We thank you for all of your love and your goodness. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. So now I'll leave the rest of this time of worship up to you. Feel free to listen to some worship songs and sing along or spend some time journaling. Maybe you'd like to reread over this story in your Bibles and highlight the bits that really stand out to you or write some notes in the margin. Um, take your time and when you're ready, you can close with the Lord's Prayer. So great to be able to worship with you and I'm so excited to be reading this Gospel of John with you. It's really such a wonderful, wonderful account of Jesus' life and ministry. I'll be worshipping again with you soon. Peace.